Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tim Brothers. Uh, so today I'm gonna be talking, it's a little unusual talk for me. So just FYI, my background is I'm, I'm an astronomer at MIT. I run MIT's Wallace Observatory in Western Massachusetts, uh, where we teach students how to use telescopes and observe the night sky. So I spend a lot of time uh, at night uh, in the dark looking up. Um, but I retooled this talk a little bit for, for this group uh, because I also have a garden that my, my wife designed. And uh, there's a lot of other factors that go into lighting at night, sometimes called artificial light at night, if you're looking it up in literature. And so I wanted to try to sort of holistically tie all of these different pieces together uh, to try to help you have a little bit healthier community in your nighttime environment, because of course it makes up 50% of uh, the, the rotation of the earth over the course of 24 hours. And so, uh, and this is sort of an unusual slide, I suppose, to to start our talk with, which is, it's a really dark picture that you can barely make anything out, but that's, that's sort of the point here. Uh, so this is actually my front yard. Uh, actually, I live, I'm sorry, yeah. Tim, um, on the Zoom, we, for some reason, it's still not showing. I'm sorry, everyone, thank you. All right, uh, so just to put it in perspective where we're looking, uh, so I live in a small town called Pepperell. It's on the New Hampshire border. Uh, it's about 12,000 people or so. Uh, we have no population growth whatsoever. Uh, it is still somewhat of an agricultural town. We have several large working farms and uh, several new ones that are starting to come back, which is really exciting. Uh, and many of us are growing food, especially during COVID, we sort of got more into it. We get chickens, we expand our garden. Maybe some of us quadrupled the size of our garden. Uh, we had a lot of time on our hands. Uh, and one thing we found was that our garden, which was in the back of the yards, we, we own a little over an acre, uh, which is just enough for us and two kids. Uh, what we found is in the back garden, of course, we have things like woodchucks and deer and things that picked away at everything. And it's in the back. And the good news is that we have generally a south facing yard. So uh, the upside is we had uh, a lot of trees cleared in the front. We re landscaped it and opened it up to get a lot more sunlight in the south facing part. The downside is we live on a busy road, Route 113, and you can see some of the traffic going by in the middle of the night. So all of this area is, in fact, we have about a quarter of an acre dedicated to our garden now, and the chicken coop and the runner over here. Uh, but what you can also see are stars overhead. And so Pepperell uh, is actually one of the few communities in Massachusetts that can still see the Milky Way at night. Uh, this is a diminishing uh, feature of many towns, particularly in Massachusetts, which has some of the fastest growing light pollution in the country. Uh, and I think nationally right now, the number is something like, uh, less than 15% of people today live in a community where they can see the Milky Way, somewhere around that number. And, and that number is, is steadily decreasing, unfortunately. Uh, in Massachusetts, it's probably even far less. Um, so the other thing I do is I help co-found the International Dark Sky Association's Massachusetts chapter. And the reason we did that uh, it was because uh, we wanted to leverage the, the power of the IDA. And it just so happens that the highest per capita uh, membership in the United States of IDA members happens to be in Massachusetts. Uh, part of that because there's so many astronomers and environmental advocates. And so we created a chapter. Uh, we have about uh, 300 people total. There's about 100 very active members, I would say. Uh, and we've been very busy the last, we, we started about four or five years ago and we've been very, very busy. And we're gonna talk about some of the work we've done. Uh, I have literature to hand out and you can take anything you want except the book. And uh, I also have uh, instruction sheet on how to talk to your town about municipal lighting. Uh, so with that, let's get moving. And I will warn you, some of these slides um, are a little dense. Don't feel like you have to read all the words. Uh, I'm gonna try to cut to, to sort of the takeaways here. Uh, so some of the basic things we're gonna be talking about is what exactly is light pollution? Let's define it. Let's make sure we're using correct terms. Uh, how much light should be in my garden? Um, I'll, spoiler alert, it's zero. Um, <laughs> consequences of inaction. So there's a whole wide range depressing uh, list of, of Yes. I'm sorry, everybody. It's still registering oh, gosh. Your, that. So I want to try one more time to get go to your share screen. That's the, yep, we're good. All okay, right, finally. thanks everyone. We're learning. Um, so some, some consequences of an action, some really simple solutions that you can take home today, and then some fun things to look at uh, when it's dark out. Um, what is that picture above? Yes. So uh, I have a couple different versions of this. Uh, so this is a NASA image. So this is at first at glance, it looks really beautiful, right? It's sort of the string of lights. Uh, these are humans, obviously, they're sort of population centers. And obviously, this is the Boston metro area. Here's the Cape and the islands. 
we have Manhattan, and we can sort of infer that this is probably light from open space. Say, imagine you're on the space station looking down uh, on the dark side of the Earth uh, during the nighttime, and we can, of course, pick out lots of things. So, for example, here's Worcester, here's Route 2, uh, I believe this is Springfield down here. We're probably, you know, somewhere over here right now. Um, and so we can infer that more people probably live generally where it's brighter, right? Uh, and so this is sort of intuitive up to this point, right? Uh, and for example, the observatory where I work at is sort of in this darkish pocket here. It's kind of right outside the 495 corridor. So it's just dark enough. That's why MIT built the observatory uh, 53 years ago away from the city. And the town I live in, Pepperell here, you can actually see it from space. So even a small agricultural town, you can see from space. Uh, the other part of this is, and part of the reason you know I got into this was because I care about stars, and, and that's sort of what I, my night job, so to speak. Um, and, and what I do at night, I look at stars, I help students observe the skies, and we started noticing some drastic changes about five or six years ago. And this is sort of the story that I think most people who become advocates for, for a pristine nighttime environment is, is you sort of have this one light that really drives you nuts, and then you can't get it out of your head. You, you, it, it sort of pops up, and this is Route 40 and Westford heading into Groton. So this is the Groton line. Uh, Groton is another sort of suburban transition town that's becoming more and more developed pretty quickly. Uh, and they own their own electric company, and the short story is they all of a sudden overnight changed all of their streetlights, and they changed them to probably some of the worst I've seen. They're very glary, they're very blue, they're very harsh. And the other problem is they have an excessive amount of contrast. So the glare means that you can't see, for example, all of the deer that are jumping across the road here. Um, it's hard to see cyclists, which is pretty popular in this area. Uh, and of course, we noticed that there's more sky glow. So let's, let's come up with some definitions. Uh, there's a million definitions for light pollution, and, and many of them are very wordy. I'm going to boil it down to essentially it's energy waste. Uh, it can come in lots of flavors, but essentially it's a form of energy waste. And as we're talking about cutting carbon, reducing our energy consumption, trying to be more efficient, um, you know, we have droughts that are obviously out of control. Uh, I'm sure everybody's trying to use less and less water. Uh, everything's very hot right now. Well, uh, the easiest thing to fix right now is light pollution. And this is a really good example of just a little bit of light that escapes can have quite a big impact. Uh, I took this a few years ago. This was during class uh, around September. The Milky Way is still up in the early evening from Wallace Observatory when we could still see it readily. Um, now this has changed. We'll get into that. Uh, and this is just a really, this is nothing special. This is not a fancy telescope. This is just a Canon Rebel on a tripod, 30 second exposure, stock lens, nothing, nothing fancy at all. So this is what all of our entry level students use. And what you'll find is, okay, that's really great. I you know, love seeing the Milky Way. Here's the core of the galaxy near the horizon. Uh, here's farther from the center. It gets dimmer and dimmer as you go up towards the north. And notice that there's some sort of red fringing on either side. And I was sort of puzzled when I tried to spruce that image up. And what I didn't realize was that, so when we work at night, we use these little red 25 watt incandescent bulbs in the dome so that we can see what we're doing, we can type in the keyboard and take notes and draw sketches of what we're looking at, but we don't disrupt our night vision too much. So we just have a few of these bulbs and, and someone happened a few nights before to take a time lapse looking directly at, but this is just from these lights shining up, hitting the atmosphere and back in. So there's no light directly in the view of the lens, it's just going directly up in the atmosphere and back down. So even just a few bulbs can make quite a difference, but that's astrophotography. I realize not everybody cares about stars. That's okay, I won't take it personally. Uh, but there's a reason why you could, you should care about light pollution. Um, and here's just one reason. So here's, let's expand that blue marble image uh, a bit further. And you see some obvious things, right? So more metropolitan areas, more, um, interstate highways, uh, note that Florida is really bright in the coast. We'll get back to that later, but then there's a couple peculiar areas. Can anybody spot them? Areas where you wouldn't expect to see a lot of bright lights. So for example, up here in North Dakota, West Texas, any ideas what those are? Now keep in mind, no, and no offense to North Dakota or West Texas, but no one really lives there. <laughs> military? It's not the military. Uh, in fact, that is oil and natural gas. 
So what happens is, the, I don't know if you've ever been out west, but um, I used to, used to live in New Mexico. So uh, you'll find these, these oil drilling rigs and methane and natural gas is trapped there. The oil people don't care about it. They keep, they're not allowed to, well, they let some go in the atmosphere uh, too much. In fact, I think it makes up about something like 40% of our methane escaping into the atmosphere, but the rest of it, they just burn off. So on the top of all these towers, it's sort of this post-apocalyptic flames shooting out of all the top of the rigs. And you can actually see that from space. So that's what these are. These are all oil drilling. The amount of natural gas that's wasted from this process is enough to heat 10 million homes per year. It's about 13 million metric tons of natural gas completely wasted what it's doing to the climate so you know while this is now we're talking about you know methane and natural gas and climate change this is also a pretty big light pollution source I saw the blue. Oh, blue. Blue. so uh the blue they actually sort of false color it to give it contrast um this is just intensity so there's no actual color um to these bright lights now the other thing is um so we sort of extrapolate and say, take that another step further. What does that actually equal in terms of energy waste? So there's been a lot of estimates over time uh, in terms of, if you just sort of draw a big circle around all the lights that are on at night, whether they're parking lots at, at the Walmart or your high school that leaves the stadium lights on all night or lights in somebody's garden, uh, what is the general percentage of light wasted at night? Um, I've seen some estimates that say 90, some that say 40, some, this one says 35. I'm going to go with the most conservative, which just says 30%. Uh, and I was able to work from a report that was done on the US and sort of extrapolate to Massachusetts just based on how much we know we spend on electricity to generate lighting in the state. And what I found is, and this is just sort of back of the envelope, don't, don't quote me on these exact numbers, they're just sort of to give you a ballpark idea of what we're wasting. And uh, I came up with something like uh, the amount of CO2 emissions from wasted light in Massachusetts is about 0.2 million metric tons, which translates to about a billion kilowatts wasted and about $180 million wasted. And that was in 2017. So obviously with inflation, that's probably a bit more. Um, so this is just to give you a general idea of like, this is a pretty decent sized problem, just in terms of the energy waste cost, extra carbon spent to do not a lot of good. The other thing I want to go over is, um, you know, some people sort of say, well, you know, the full moon's up, you know, that that's up, that's pretty bright. Um, so these lights can't be a, too big of a problem. The, the thing is that uh, when you actually start comparing the actual brightness of the full moon and what it looks like on the ground, so that's what's hitting your plants, what's hitting your walkway. Maybe you like to go for night hikes like I do in the middle of the woods and on a nice full moon night. Uh, you can see just fine with the full moon, right? Uh, but the lights that we employ throughout our life are quite a bit brighter. For example, Fenway Park is about 6,000 times more powerful uh, in terms of the, the ground illumination than the average full moon. Uh, when I tried to measure my, any of my garden spots, including in my chicken run uh, the other night in preparation for this, uh, it was actually below what this, this is a light meter. This is what anybody, say your building inspector uses to, to measure at the property line. Um, if there's light trespass, if there's a complaint or so on. And this, this is a pretty inexpensive device. It costs about $100 or so. Uh, and so I was pretty happy, you know, we, as, as I suspected that, you know, we're doing pretty good. Despite being on a busy road, there's a street light maybe 100 feet from our garden. Uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, and there's a lot of research too into, as we'll get deeper into it in a bit, the circadian rhythm disruption. So uh, just about all living creatures have some sort of circadian rhythm, particularly humans. And they've been doing more and more research and it, it seems like every time they do a study, this number keeps sort of getting revised downward. So, um, you know, we know even some people, just the full moon shining through your window will wake you up. And many people, especially in urban environments, are getting subjected to this or even several times this from overlighting, uh, largely out of fear for crime. They're sort of overlighting neighborhoods. Uh, it's actually been shown to increase crime, believe it or not. And uh, we're subjecting ourselves to this massive, experiment where we're overlighting ourselves uh, throughout the night. So uh, I'm going to go quickly through some definitions of light pollution. Uh, there's sort of like three general categories, and there's one I'm going to tack on there. 
Uh, and so this is your typical light, right? This is, this is across the street from me. This is a Cobra Head street light. And many of these are disappearing, right? So overnight, especially in Massachusetts, I think we've upgraded uh, about 70%. So most of these are gone now. And they have now switched to LED. And that's just about five years. So we've significantly changed the light we have at night, the predominant source, just in a few years in Massachusetts. And this is the same in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and so on. Um, and so you have useful light, right? There's a purpose to this light. Maybe somebody wants to cross the crosswalk, maybe you have a skateboarder in the middle of the night, you don't want to hit them. Uh, so there's purposes to that light. Uh, but when the light escapes the useful area, uh, maybe it's too bright. Remember I showed you that picture earlier. Obviously this guy's not super happy. Uh, he's probably not happy because the light was also trespassing to his bedroom. He probably couldn't sleep. And some of this light is actually shining directly upward. So these old high pressure sodium, the, the orangey uh, glow bulbs with the, the little lens that hung down, uh, about 2% of the light was just shining directly upward in the sky. Um, and then the fourth thing we're gonna talk about is color temperatures. That's really just a fancy word for saying the appearance of the color. So quickly, just here are some examples. This is uh, Groton Center driving uh, this, those same lights I was mentioning. And the problem here is the amount of glare because they're fairly poorly shielded. Uh, the amount of blue content in the light makes it that much harder to contrast. And what you can't see is there's actually a crosswalk right here. And there's a sign which you can barely see. And with the inclement weather, uh, you would not actually be able to see someone crossing into the crosswalk because of the glare, the direct glare and the indirect glare off the surface of the, the slick roadway. So it's actually a safety hazard as well. So it doesn't even work. No, it, it, it sort of defeats the purpose. So light you know, isn't bad inherently, it should have a purpose, but there's ways to fix that, that problem right there. The other thing is uh, light trespass. So I went to a, a Rite Aid, I noticed, and this is another huge problem. Uh, there's a purpose this light. They apparently wanted to light up the side of a right aid in the middle of the night. Uh, and this is on for about 10 hours a night. The problem is they mounted it incorrectly. This light is supposed to be shining downward. They mounted it horizontally. And so a very small percentage of the light is actually hitting the building. And I went to the neighbor's property line and I was able to read a book about dark skies just fine uh, at about 2 a.m. So that's a good example of light trespass. Sky glow, uh, there's been lots of studies. They're still trying to figure out, you know, what's the, the main culprit for sky glow. This is an example. We, we take this snapshot every four minutes or so from the observatory. The reason we installed it originally was actually because the traffic is so bad from Boston to Westford that we wanted to know what the weather was ahead of time. And then we realized this is a really great tool to figure out how light pollution is changing over time. And what you'll notice, so this is east. So, so Boston is kind of over here to the southeast. Uh, let's see, Lowell is over here, Chelmsford. Uh, and then this was the bright area. And when I started in 2009, this was Inky Black. This is New Hampshire, uh, Groton and Dunstable. Uh, let's see, Air, Acton, Westford. Littleton. Yeah, Littleton. Uh, and then you'll notice just in a few years, they added strip mall after strip mall after strip mall after movie theater after car dealership. And then Groton added their lights over here. And then they started adding all these post top fancy like faux gas lamp LEDs everywhere. And we started losing real estate here. And being a planetary science department, most of the objects we study in our department are in our imaginary arc right about here. So we started noticing, geez, there, there's a real quantitative decrease in the number of stars, hazardous asteroids we're trying to monitor. We better start engaging the community and figure out what, what exactly is the, the reason. Uh, the biggest culprit is up light. So that was the, the light that's just, for whatever reason, it's 100% it's, it's energy waste. Whatever is up light is waste. There's, there's no purpose to it. Uh, and then there's some other factors. We don't have to get too deep into this, but spectral power distribution is a really fancy word for saying what's the amount of particular colors in the light. Uh, so that plays a role in, in how that, that changes the sky glow. Uh, if the light's overly bright, and is it showing where it's supposed to go? Remember, is it useful or not? But the main thing is up light. Here's a really good example of good intentions gone bad. So the idea was, well, here's our library. Uh, we want people to be able to safely feel like, I guess they can drop books off at two in the morning. Uh, and the idea was to illuminate this walkway, except they wanted to put fancy lights. And so, you know, maybe 10% of the light is going over here, 50% is going into space, and a bunch is going over here on the grass, not really serving a lot of purpose, and they're very blue and they're mounted too high. 
you could have accomplished the same task with probably a tenth of the wattage and kept them really low and actually just illuminating only the walkway and then it wouldn't be glary. Um, and by the way, to fix this problem, this was subsidized by the state, uh, is probably on the order of $3,000 to fix six lights. Uh, same thing with this is our fire station, uh, again, subsidized by the state through many of these supposed mass greening programs. Uh, these are called wall packs. You'll see those on the side of industrial buildings. These are notorious for light pollution. Uh, they're often very high in color temperature, which means a high blue content. And much of the light is going right up in space or in a neighbor's yard. So we get a lot of complaints in town from those. Here's another example. Now we're going to get a little bit closer to what you're all here for. The now prevalent LED grow house that's popping up everywhere. So the first one we noticed was, I thought the carnival was in town uh, coming home from the observatory. And this was about two and a half towns away. We started seeing this and the sky was pink and purple. And this was one little town uh, operation called Little Leaf Farms. And, and believe me, they've been forced to fix it since then, but it, it made the news. Uh, everybody was, you know, sort of dumbfounded as to what was going on. This is one of the first ones in the area. There was another one they had problems with in Chelmsford. I know there's a massive 40,000 foot grow house for marijuana plant in the Berkshires that they're also worried about. Um, so they're popping up everywhere. I think it was on the news the other day. Again, there was a large one in Australia that turned, you know, the sky pink and purple for, you know, miles and miles away. And this is what they're doing. So most of it's, you know, whether it's microgreens or tomatoes or cannabis. Um, the good news is super easy fix. Uh, motorized retractable shades. They completely solve this problem. I haven't seen the sense. It's automated. You know, once it gets dusk, they they retract it. They can do their thing. It's fine. That's how you choose to grow. Um, but the light doesn't escape now. So super easy fix. But you do sort of need regulations in town or someone keeping an eye on when these things come into town and they come before a zoning board. They're growing. They're keeping the lights on for the plants yeah. when it's dark outside. Yes. They want a longer day length for the plants. Yeah, they're really juicing the plants. Essentially, you're trying to. It's like day. Yeah, you're, oh. you're just you sort of. I think some of them you start with 24 hour grow cycles, and then you start alternating, and then you can mix and match the colors to try to get certain effects. You know, especially when they change to fruit production and so on. But um, there's all sorts of little technical tricks they're playing around with. Um, supposedly, it's more efficient. I, I don't know, but um, anyway, that's what some people choose to do. So. Just be aware that those are popping up kind of everywhere. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of good, different examples. I'm a more of a visual person of what color temperature is, uh, but I'll give you a, some graphs, but also some, some of these colors. And I have a little bit overly contrasted just so you get the idea. So the higher the number with a K after it, and these are on the side of the box, you buy any bulb at the store, they're going to have this, it's going to have more blue content. The lower the number, it's going to look more like firelight. It's going to have more red content. Okay. So the lights that we all grew up with, incandescent, uh, were right about here, 2700. Okay, they're sort of that warm white color. And the first LEDs that started popping up a few years ago were kind of more in this area. They're really bright white blue LEDs. And now really the, every color is available. Um, so there's no excuse to use um, you know, the colors I'm gonna recommend in a minute. Here's another way of looking at this is just spectrum if you're more of a spectrum person. Uh, so this is sunlight. Obviously, you get all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, and then we switch to incandescent. You know, those are great. They, they are pretty close to sunlight, except that they have a lot of waste in the infrared, which is why we got rid of them, right? So this light you can't see, it just creates a lot of heat, which is energy waste. And then briefly, we switched to compact fluorescent uh, that had that sort of sickly green glow. The other problem was uh, throwing them away. One bulb uh, would, I think, poison something like 5,000 gallons of water. So we got rid of those too. And now we're on to LED. And the thing is with LED, a lot of people don't realize this, is, is the way they actually work is it's actually a blue LED. Uh, this is something that someone got the Nobel Prize for in 2014 for energy efficiency, which was super exciting because we could create energy efficient lights. Yay, um, that's a good thing. Uh, and the way they did that was they have, it's actually just a blue LED inside the bulb if you broke it open and they coat the inside of the bulb with phosphorescent paint. The blue LED reacts with that paint and then emits photons of different colors. Your eye averages the two out and sort of thinks it's somewhere in the middle. Um, so that's called a blue pump LED, and that's probably about 95% of the LEDs that you find in your home. It's the same thing that is, um, you know, these blue pump LEDs are also in the backlights for your laptop or your, your cell phone or whatever. And this is the, you know, if you buy a, if you go to a big box store and you buy a light bulb, 
99% of the time, they're gonna have this sticker on the side of the box and they're gonna have a few facts. They're gonna have lumens, which is the brightness, and they're gonna have the color temperature. So notice, for example, this one says 2700K. So they can actually make LEDs now the same color as the incandescent for the most part. But when you actually look at the spectrum, you can see sort of what I'm talking about. The higher the K number, the Kelvin number, the more prominent that blue spike. So these are early generation LEDs or cheaper ones. And then you get now some that are a bit more color balanced um, that the blue spike isn't so predominant. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna do a little demo here. I'm just gonna turn this on. So this is a color tunable um, light. I don't know if I want to reposition the camera yeah, so they can see it. Um, okay. I have a question. Yes. Can you explain, so what is it you're saying that yeah, uh, it's preferable to have warmer colors? Yeah. Uh, for, in, in terms of light pollution, and, but in terms of energy, like the wasted energy of an incandescent light, one third of it is wasted energy. Right. Um, as opposed to the LED. So, how, how do you balance the energy waste with the light pollution? We have the technology, we can okay. do it. Yeah, we're, we're, that's what I'm gonna sort of head to. And I don't wanna get too deep into these graphs, but I just wanna give you the idea that, especially now, so we have those blue pump LEDs, now we have red, green, blue, so now they have multiple different colors, so they can do all sorts of color mixing and matching. Uh, in fact, eventually, probably in 10 years, we'll have street lights and municipal lighting that will actually change colors at different times, depending on the situation, whether you're having the carnival in town or you're having low light because it's the middle of the night. Uh, many box stores already do this. You just don't realize that they're actually changing the color at different times of day. Uh, and so, for example, uh, we can mimic just about any of these uh, old colors that we had. So for example, I can, uh, so right now we are on um, same colors incandescent. And let's say we go back to those early generation LEDs and they're very blue. And you can imagine um, when it catches in the eye, right? I won't do it too much, but it's, it's pretty miserable. Um, and there's a reason why that one is bothering you more. And then we came up with a 4,000K. Um, that was many of the early streetlights. And uh, we'll go back to the, the warm white. And the new LEDs, we're, we're pushing farther and farther um, towards 2,200K. That's the same color as the original high pressure sodium. So we actually have lights now that mimic that color. Uh, there's a reason why we're, we're actually going back towards that color range. Uh, and then we have um, other ones, for example, this one's sort of oddly called, and this is the Philips Hue bulb starlight, um, which is a very purple light, blue purple. It's actually the worst possible color if you wanna see stars, oddly <laughs> enough. Um, so the other really cool thing is we have the technology now um, to actually dim them. So many of your street lights can actually dim to different levels. They can actually set the levels. It just so happens most towns don't bother using the technology that we paid for at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, so we can get back to more of that and I can let you play with that towards the end. But I just wanna give you an idea that there's a lot of flavors to this rainbow now. Uh, and so we have to sort of be aware, what effect does that have? Um, don't worry about, this is a little bit technical slide I use for classes, but uh, what I want to get across here is that, so this is the blue pump LED spectrum. This is the old high pressure sodium. And notice what a significant change, what a significant experiment we're doing on ourselves, going from this light that we've been used to since you know, the 50s or so. And before that, we weren't using any light, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, we've shifted the spectrum of our nighttime environment. And the other thing is that there's this other thing called Rayleigh scattering. This is the same reason our sky is blue. So sunlight comes in, the blue light likes to scatter more than the other colors. It's just a physical law. We've known about it for hundreds of years. The same thing is gonna happen here with these blues. So now you have a much bigger quantity of blue and it's gonna scatter. What, it mean, what I mean by scatter, it's gonna go everywhere you don't want it to go. So that's why you're seeing sort of this opaque blue, gray, brown look to the sky now, because it's going not just, it's not just a light dome on the horizon, it's now finding its way everywhere throughout the environment. So that's bad for astronomy, it's bad for wildlife, and it's certainly bad for your sleeping. Blue light, blue light scatters more? Yes, it's a physical law uh, called Rayleigh scattering. Um, and the other problem is blue light scatters, not just in the atmosphere, but in your eye more. So the human eye, especially as you get older and you get more particles in your eye, they get cloudier. 
the blue light's gonna scatter more, your eye's gonna have a harder time recovering, you're gonna have more glare, less contrast, and more blur, which is why many older drivers are complaining now, I can't drive anymore. We change the spectrum to a spectrum that is harder to see at night, it's glary, and that becomes a safety issue again. Okay, so let's look down now. Is it really changing? Well, we do have satellites up in space that are looking back down and they're, you know, they can actually quantitatively measure these things. There's a couple caveats, but let's just look at the area I live in. So for example, you know, here's Westford, uh, the observatory is somewhere out here and here's Pepperell. I live kind of a little bit darker area near the ponds. And to put it in perspective, like what do these colors mean? Don't worry about the units, but I'll tell you that. So for example, obviously in Lowell, you're not gonna see very much. Uh, and then let's sort of put a dividing line with where we can see the Milky Way. So anywhere that's blue or dark blue, you can probably see the Milky Way on a clear night in the summer. The green may be on a really nice clear night, certainly yellow, it's gonna be washed out if anything in red, no way. So this is 2012 and let's skip a few years forward to, I think it's gonna be 2020. Notice the change and then one more year, so I'll go back again. So we're seeing a pretty dramatic change. Uh, the problem is when you look at quantitatively, it doesn't look like it's changing that much. The issue is that the sensor that was on that sp spacecraft that's looking down can see these colors, which capture the high pressure sodium. It cannot see blue at all. So we have a way of like correcting for that. And we've come up with something like and this is sort of an accepted figure now that nationally light pollution is growing at 2.2% a year, which is way above population growth. So the takeaway here really is that LED is great, efficiency awesome, but we've missed the opportunity to save the energy. We just put out more LEDs. It's called the rebound effect. We just put more light out there because it was cheaper to do so. Don't worry, I, I know this is a lot of crap. So astronomers love having 75 charts to describe the same exact thing. Um, the numbers that I'm gonna look at, this is what I use, it's the magnitude system. So the, the lower the number, the brighter your sky. And then you get your top out at about 22 magnitude. So this is like if I went to the middle of New Mexico or Chile, you'd be somewhere around here. You lose the Mount Milky Way around 20.2. So I'm gonna use that as our dividing line and say, this is what I'm gonna call a pristine nighttime environment for your garden. And that's, you know, a little bit above that, um, about 20.4, you can just barely make it out on a moonless night. And uh, that's where we are in Westford, right, riding, now we're actually getting closer to the red line again. Uh, and you'll notice too, the number of stars dramatically changes. So, you know, you should be able to see about seven, six or 7,000 stars over the course of the year. And you start going down just the magnitude and, you know, you're less than half of that. Um, so obviously in like say Boston or something like, you're lucky if you can see 10 or 20 stars, um, just to give you a reference for what we're talking about here. So we can measure that. You, you can buy this, you know, I use this meter. Um, we have one of these that automatically records and uh, it gives you a number and gives you that magnitude and just write it down. And there's this really neat program um, called Globe at Night. It's free. And in fact, you don't even need one of these meters. Uh, you can actually just use your eyes. And what they do is they give you a constellation for each month uh, you go outside, it's great activity to do with kids. You, they give you like seven pictures. They have a phone app. You click which one the sky most looks like. So the, for example, this month, the constellation is Hercules, which is a pretty easy one to find. And they're able to calculate what is the change in light pollution over the course of time, you just put in your location. Uh, and so, um, you know, they get tens of thousands of people to record these. And the idea is that we'll sort of create a, a world census of, of how this is changing uh, until we can get a better satellite up in space. Uh, they can see all the colors. Uh, and this is, by the way, so this is from Pepperell. This is our conservation lens, it's probably the darkest spot in Pepperell. And before the LED uh, retrofit, we were getting about 20.4. So we're just barely able to see uh, the Milky Way um, at that point. Uh, the other part uh, is there's enormous direct effects to your bodily health right away. Uh, so the American Medical Association, just like, you know, they came out with reports about smoking, came out with a report a few years ago about light pollution. Uh, and this is about humans, but it really it's going to affect all sorts of creatures because we all have the same mechanisms that dictate circadian rhythm. 
Uh, and so one of the, the recommendations, you know, they said definitely reduce glare. That's bad for driving, like we talked about earlier. At the time, the best you could get was 3,000K. So they said definitely don't go over that and make sure it's shielded. And it's supported by everybody from the Mass Municipal Association, the World Health Organization, even GE Lighting, who makes the lights, and US insurance agents, and, and so on and so on. There's a million organizations that, that support this work. Okay, let's get to why that act, all of the stuff I just mentioned matters. Well, everybody knows we have an eyeball, right? And that's how we form images. And uh, most creatures have eyeballs of some sort that find their way and uh, to do the task they need to do. And especially for nocturnal animals, uh, that's really important, right? Because you need to find your way, you need to find your food, find your mate, find your, you know, whatever you need to do. Uh, and we have rods and cones, everybody knew about that. Well, it turns out there's a third sensor that we discovered just a few years ago called ganglion cells. So these are non-image forming sensors. They're at sort of the back of the eye. And these, it turns out, all sorts of creatures have these, as they're finding. Um, or some creatures have different variations of, of how this works, but generally the same thing. And what they're looking at is generally two things, intensity, so the brightness of the environment, and the color blue. Uh, it's an evolutionary trait handed down from creatures that lived in the ocean billions of years ago. The reason being, blue light is the only light that filters through the top layer of the ocean. So they were looking to see, is it daylight? Is it time to come up for food or whatever you have to do as an early ocean creature? Uh, and it turns out humans function the same way. Uh, we are looking for that day and night cycle that dictates this whole clock. And this whole clock dictates a whole range of functions. And a lot of that has to do with things like hormones, such as melatonin. We've all heard about melatonin. You use it to fall asleep. But if these are getting stimulated because of too much light in the room, especially if you're in an urban environment, you have a street light that's shining in your window, you're looking at your phone before bed, uh, it is going to suppress the melatonin. And then all these things that are supposed to happen at certain times are going to get disrupted. And sometimes they will literally flip upside down. So uh, they have been related to everything from prostate cancer, colon cancer, diabetes, metabolic disorders, sleep disorders, mental health disorders. Uh, one of the most studied is actually breast cancer. There's actually a link with an actual increase of 14% more likelihood to have breast cancer if you are overly stimulated with bright light at night. So the takeaway here is, you know, blue light definitely makes it worse, but in general, just light period disrupting you is bad, but blue light can make it worse. Uh, so there's all these functions that, that we do, and animals uh, are, are no different. Um, there's two types of, there's a few different types of sensitivity we have. Um, this is the, what we form images. So when we're looking at the screen right now, this is our photopic. This is the colors that we can actually see. But those ganglion cells are over here in the blue. They're centered around 460 nanometers. And guess what? Look where this LED pump, just by bad luck, happens to sit. It's like a key in a keyhole. Um, this is not by design, this was just bad luck when they designed these um, and the physical properties of the LEDs, that they just happen to stimulate perfectly in that sensor, those ganglion cells. And they did this really novel experiment uh, a few years ago where they, they took a, a blind person who had rods and cones that don't work, so they can't form images, but the ganglion cells do work. And they, they shown two different color LEDs, a blue and a green. This is the melatonin in their blood over time. So when they put the green LED in their eye, the melatonin stayed fine. But when they put a blue LED in, the melatonin was suppressed and they couldn't sleep. So they've done lots of experiments. So I could go on and on forever about this. Um, but this is pretty solid scientific background now. And similarly, um, I'm going to blow through a couple of these studies. But uh, they've done things like monitoring high um, Areas where we have lots of light pollution, so these are different, we broke them into different quarters, and the likelihood that you'll be prescribed sleep aids like Ambien. So it goes up and up. The more, so the more light you have, the more likely you're going to get Ambien as a prescription, and you're going to get a higher dose. Well, we have a solution for your light problems. So just give me jobs. Yeah. Well, that's that's the problem, right? Is we you know this is a we can fix this. It's just we're we're sort of putting band aids on things because we didn't really understand what was actually going on. Um, there's also this, this one I find really interesting. Um, this was a recent study in, in journal of psychiatry, uh, particularly about adolescents, which are often overlooked. And, and again, they call it Allen, which is artificial light at night was associated with 1.07 times the odds of mood disorders, 10% increase in anxiety disorders, 
and then you know goes on and on and particularly as you can imagine they went on to say that this is going to affect people in urban environments so we have sort of an equity issue of we're dumping a lot of light in certain areas uh and we sort of need to think about that um why we're doing that and what the, the overall long-term effects are uh, on children and now we'll get into animals and pollinators so Briefly, I mean, there's been over 100 different studies on 100 different species. Uh, this is the you know different spectrums of light that you've already seen, and this is where they can see in their likelihood that they're going to be affected. So you know whether it's a spider or a bunny rabbit, uh, they can all see these these forms of light, and and their foraging, their navigation, their predation, their communication, their camouflage are going to be affected uh, from this this introduction of this changing light, but also increased amount of light. Now. Plants in particular are immediately sensitive, uh, as we all know. Uh, and so they've done actually a lot of studies on soybeans. Uh, in fact, I looked up, they've been studying light effects on soybeans since the 1920s, they've known about this. Uh, and so what they found was uh, soybeans are particularly sensitive to the dusk, the oncoming dusk and uh, the night length. And they know that, and, and by the way, the moonlight is not enough to stimulate that. Uh, but a bright street light nearby is, and you can actually see these soybeans started flowering way too early. They're now useless. Uh, and these ones are just getting going at their normal day night cycle. Uh, so these are just growing, but they're not gonna be anything you could harvest. Um, and so one thing, uh, this is from the University of Nebraska, uh, big agricultural school. They actually said you should be having essentially a cutoff. You should not plant your soybeans within 50 feet of these things. Uh, which makes sense. So the light actually here, they're, remember, they're actually supposed to be shining over here. They're shining over here as well. This is not useful light. This is called backlight. And that's something easily controlled now uh, with something called house side shields. Uh, this was a really big study. Uh, the artificial light as a new threat to pollinators. Uh, and so what they found was in the areas where they had more light, uh, there was a 62% reduction in visits from nocturnal pollinators. Uh, when I started this journey of learning about artificial light, I had no idea, in fact, that uh, there was nocturnal pollinators. Um, and it turns out they're very important, everything from moths and, and butterflies and, and different forms of wasps. And, and there's a couple uh, bees, I believe, that pollinate at night as well. 29% uh, fewer species were at these illuminated sites. And that resulted in 13% reduction in your fruit set. So that's not a small number. And when you start looking at that by the things that you know politicians care about, in 2009 alone, that was $361 billion lost. That's not a small thing, when, especially when we're, we're worried about droughts and then we're sort of shooting ourselves in the foot by reducing our fruit set even further. I like pictures, so let's look at a different version of this. Uh, so this is sort of a more you know, global view of this whole farm situation. So you know, you might have some wetlands nearby, you have your corn or your, maybe your cassava beans or your maize. Uh, and not just are you suppressing the production of your fruit, but you're also attracting pests, slugs, everything you don't want. You know, um, uh, the gentleman before me was talking about, you know, spraying. Well, everyone's spraying their yards, uh, but then they have all these lights on at night and then they're attracting the bugs back in the yard. And then you have population collapses because then those bugs that are actually important can't find their food, they can't find their mate. And so you, you really disrupt a whole bunch of cycles uh, just with a few misplaced lights. Are and lights, I'm sorry, are there lights that are less apt to attract bugs? Because I've noticed even with the indoor lights, uh, we don't have any outdoor lights, but the indoor lights, we get bugs all over our windows all the time. And it's like short of like pulling all the curtains and stuff. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so of course, you know, we all get in the summertime some moss on our screen door, right? I mean, this not a lot you can do that but you can always turn off your porch lights to not attract them directly to the door these are indoor like okay we don't, we don't have porch lights or anything it's just the, yeah the I, room light that we're using. so i will say that um what i'm not advocating for is perfection we're not saying you need to live in darkness um what we're saying is just put a little bit of thought like i'm a big fan of 10 percent solutions so like start by like this year fixing one light outside especially outside that's gonna matter the most we have lights indoors. We want to read. We want to watch TV. Like I, I can't expect you to turn all the lights off. But are there us. certain types of lights, like the LED versus the incandescent, that would attract them more or less? Uh, generally, the warmer the color, the better. And you could also dim the light. 
So, you know, on several of our lights now, we have, um, you know, the little switches in the wall. Easy. I just dim it down to 20%. We can see fine and it adds a nice ambient glow. And even many of them now, when you dim them, they actually turn color to more like a candlelight, which is really cool. Um, the other thing we see, and this is popping up, especially the area I live in, are these gardens. Some of them are supposed to be pollinator gardens and they are illuminated all night long with search lights. And um, I guess to show off that you have a tree, the problem is um, you're often you're killing the tree. Um, you'll see one side of it growing more than the other. They'll be sort of lopsided. Uh, often you'll see them sort of grow where you don't want them to grow, or maybe they'll sort of die off because they'll attract a certain bug that'll eat it. Um, and this one is sort of, I don't know, I even know what to say about that one. But, um, you know, I realize people, you know, want to be able to walk through their garden, but you could also put a switch on it so that it's not on all the time. If that's your goal to have a garden party, fine. Um, but it doesn't need to be on, you know, 12 hours a day, especially, you know, it's sort of the downside to, okay, great, it's solar powered, you're not using electricity, but you're dumping a lot of light where there didn't used to be light. And if your goal is to attract, you know, beneficial bugs, um, you know, whether it's that or I, I've also started to uncover these popping up everywhere that, you know, sort of these battery operated very gardens that are out there. It's the same deal. You know, they're, it doesn't matter what kind of light you're, you're putting light in an area that doesn't need it and doesn't want it. Um, so just use caution as you go through it. This was one of my favorite ones I looked up for this talk uh, from New York Magazine, the 10 very best garden lights. And these are literally some of the worst lights I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> they are 7,000 K, which I didn't even know they made. And 100% of the light is going up in space. The idea it said in the, in the description, and they, apparently they tested this, was to illuminate this walkway, which I cannot see. Um, and I would find it incredibly, you know, blinding as I'm trying to take a stroll with, you know, with a glass of wine and talk to your friends, I guess. And you're just blinded by these horrible lights that are shining up into space, uh, I guess for alien, I don't know. Um, fireflies, this is one of my favorite things to talk about uh, because this is especially heavily studied in Massachusetts, thanks to Mass Audubon. Now, one thing about headlines, notice the order that they say top threats to fireflies include habitat loss, pesticides, and light pollution. If you actually read the paper, the order is habitat loss, light pollution, and then pesticides. Uh, so habitat loss, they mean stop disrupting your yard so much, leave some dead wood at the edge. So you, know, you can have your gardens, your lawn, whatever, but at the edge, if you've got a little wooded edge, leave some dead wood, some dead logs for them to plant their larvae, because they only have a two week span they're alive. They need to plant that larvae for the next year or two years out. Uh, so they need a place to do that. And light pollution is gonna disrupt them. It's gonna attract them to the wrong place. They might miss their signal to mate. They're using light to communicate with each other. They might miss the wrong signal. Uh, and then pesticides, of course, you know, as usual, just stop spraying, for goodness sake. Um, so if you want help, uh, again, there's this Mass Firefly Watch. It's run out of Tufts University in Fitchburg State in Mass Audubon. And we actually invited them to the observatory a few weeks ago and had a really great time. And they taught us all about fireflies. Uh, they gave us a presentation, taught us how to count them, how to participate in the study. Uh, it's really easy. You can watch videos online, but um, they do give talks at different Audubon sites throughout the state. Uh, and here they are actually at the observatory teaching our students. They're collecting them. Um, and by the way, two years ago, we had no fireflies at the observatory. We used to have them all the time in the summer. For a few years, they started dwindling, we sort of got concerned. We called these folks, they came out. Um, we talked to them for a couple of years. We made some improvements and uh, now we have a light show at night. Uh, and by the way, this was the week that we collected them. It turns out we have five species now. This was throughout the country, the reported. So it turns out people all over the country are reporting to the Massachusetts site now, which is really great. And this is what we found. Um, so here's one of our telescope domes. These are stars. These green flashes and all these little dots at the tree line, those are all fireflies, hundreds of them. So this is about a half hour exposure, but this is what they do. And so they're flying around, they're communicating, they're mating, and they're around for two weeks and then they die. Um, and then you hope that they come back next year. But we're super excited because after a little bit of work, we when we had to do some tree clearing, we had them lay the logs at the, the edge here. We further cut our light pollution on some of our buildings. We got some other neighboring sites to cut theirs. And uh, we actually stopped the spraying. So they were spraying for ticks. There's a lot of concern about liability with ticks. We actually asked them this year, don't spray. And uh, it turns out this is the, by, uh, you know, we also let the field go to wildflower. So we stopped clearing it. And it's all beautiful wildflowers now. There's berries growing and um, there's tons of fireflies, there's turkeys, there's all sorts of wildlife there. And we have no ticks this year. 
go figure. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much on this one, but migratory birds, uh, they've done a lot of studies. In particular, blue lights are more likely to attract them, and attract them as I mean fly into things. Uh, so somewhere around uh, 100 million to a billion birds die each year because of artificial light. Um, communication towers in particular are a big problem, and that color part exacerbates the problem. Good news, we have a super easy solution. For skyscrapers, we have these things called occupancy sensors now. In some places, they're required. They shut the lights off when no one's in the room. That eliminates much of the problem. What is that picture with the person inside a dead bird? Those are all dead birds outside of a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. It's sad, but these are realities we have to, to look at when we're, we're planning our communities. Turtles has actually been a, a relative success story with light. Um, through a, a campaign of education in Florida and regulation, so a two-prong approach, they have some pretty strong bylaws on their coastal communities. Uh, so remember I, I showed you, it's very bright along here, especially the Miami area, uh, and they enacted all sorts of bylaws to try to restrict and one of the neat things is this is a really simple solution, right? So people with their, you know, in the parking lots or, you know, maybe you have a restaurant with parking lots near the ocean where the turtles are coming up to lay, just put a little berm or a low fence, blocks all the headlights, had enormous impact keeping it dark for the turtles. And then within a few years, they saw many of the populations of all sorts of different species going up. So that's a really good sign. Uh, the downside is uh, this year, uh, the current governor uh, is trying to, break all of those, those bylaws. So there's actually a contentious fight right now because it's actually been a huge success in terms of conservation. Uh, fish, if you care about fishing in your rivers or you know, ocean, uh, same thing. You know, they also have melatonin. Uh, if, you have, if your bridge is illuminated and that's where they happen to be spawning, you're gonna be suppressing them. They're not gonna be sleeping at the right time and they're probably gonna miss their chance to mate. Okay, simple solutions. I realize all of that was super depressing, but good news. <laughs> We don't need to invent any new technology to solve this problem. Uh, the IDA, which is what I volunteer with, uh, combined forces with the, uh, the actual lighting manufacturers, one of the, the consulting agencies, the IES, and they came together and said, let's, let's agree on what we can actually do to change our environment. Uh, and they came with five really easy qualitative things you can do. Make sure the light's useful, make sure it's targeted, use lower light levels. We're often finding that with LEDs, we actually only need to use a quarter to a third of the brightness that we did with the old incandescent or high pressure sodium. So that's sort of another sort of low hanging fruit for trying to cut carbon and electricity. Don't do these one to one installations. If it was 3000 lumens in your street light before, you can probably get away with 1000 and go even further in terms of energy reduction. And then the color, this is the color we generally recommend. So uh, especially in, in sensitive areas, I would go try to go towards 2200K, uh, but certainly, you know, your average street light or municipal light or your outdoor light on your, your porch, that's probably just fine there, the, the warm white. Uh, and you know, these are readily available. You know, there's a lot of bad lights at big box stores, but you can find you know, barn lights with the uh, embedded LED, you know, they can have LEDs and they're all tucked up here and there's no uplight, right? Because it's completely shielded. Uh, here's a classic floodlight. Person who's probably not happy before, he just added a little fence there and now you can see the stars again. Uh, and as the old saying goes, good fences make good neighbors. So um, the other thing, so this is my chicken coop at night. Uh, normally it's pitch, pitch black. Uh, you can see some cars in the distance there about 200 feet away. Uh, I added a motion sensor solar powered light. So it only comes on if a fox comes to the door or if I need to go check for eggs before I go to bed. Uh, but it's just illuminating the area I needed to. It's 2700K, it's solar powered, and uh, there's no uplight to it at all. Smart controls. Um, this is more at the municipal level, but just to give you an idea, like when you go to your town and say, can you make a change, uh, whether it's on your street light, it's that little thing that's on top of the street light. You see this little cup here. Um, it costs a few dollars generally to add to your street light. Uh, the state is largely subsidizing this. So most towns have these, they're just not using them. So they're still operating at hundred percent. So it's sort of this thing like you could literally go today to your board of selectmen and say, how about we cut down the, uh, the illumination and save some more electricity. Uh, occupancy sensors have been found to save almost 90% of electricity uh, in a building uh, for lighting. So that's another exciting thing. And then you have more birds. Uh, the other part is regulation. Uh, I know this is a dense slide, but uh, we do have a, a legislation pending in the Massachusetts legislature. We are the only state in the Northeast that has not passed any outdoor lighting, believe it or not, for 
super environmentally friendly Massachusetts. Um, and it's been pending. We've been trying for over 20 years to get it passed. We got really close this year. It's still sitting in the House and Senate Ways and Means, um, but the session just ended, as some of you may know. So even Nevada, a few weeks ago, passed, you know, home of Las Vegas, passed a light pollution bill. Uh, so we have a lot to do here in Massachusetts. And one of the most important things is the thing that I thought I would care least about, and then I learned more about it when we wrote this, uh, is something called the tariff structure in Massachusetts. And the way that works, really briefly, is streetlights are unmetered. Electricity companies get to basically charge whatever they want for coal. And so once they switched LEDs, they said, well, we'll, ch we'll, we'll give you a discount. Because remember, they used to be like 100 watts. You put in LEDs. Well, they said, well, we'll charge you 25 watts. The problem is LEDs are much more efficient now. And especially when you start dimming, they might be more like 10 watts. But they still get to charge you 25 watts. So not only are you paying for that, your town's paying for that. Um, but that sort of disincentivizes the cutting of electricity, right? Because why would a town manager care if you can never save the extra money? Because that's typically what they're sort of looking at is the bottom line. Um, the other approach is you can go through various bylaws. That's a whole separate discussion and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about that. Um, here's what I think we're most proud of, of what we were able to accomplish. So, we sort of missed the boat on you know the other 65 percent of the, the towns in massachusetts but when they came i knew they were coming to pepperell because we were one of the last holdouts in the area and so i i wrote a bylaw um that was pending at the time and part of the the deal was i said for the town to do a big municipal lighting project you're going to have to have public comment which helps slow things down and provides public comment which is important input uh, but i also said we have to have a demo and a demo is a really great tool because it requires citizen input. And what we did was actually, this was a blind study. We did two lights of each type. These are different types of LEDs. And we threw in the old high pressure sodium as a control and didn't tell anybody what they were. We had four 2700K, one brand new 2200K that no one had, this was brand new, no one had ever seen it before. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And then we had the old high pressure sodium. We did surveys, we didn't tell, People, they just gave them letters. They didn't know what they were voting on. And we asked them questions like, which had the best glare? Which one do you like the best? Which gives the best color? It turns out the one they liked the best was the 2200K LED. Now you might say, okay, Tim just said, that's a really good color to choose. It must be more expensive. It turned out to be the cheapest one out of all of them. And then we also found that, so the first week did 100%. So that's sort of classic one-to-one -one brightness. The next week I convinced the town manager, let's try 50%. First of all, no one noticed that they dimmed because the human eye is highly adaptable, but that's also what people prefer. They felt like they could see better, they just didn't know why. The other neat thing was when you start looking at the spectrum, so here's compared to what the, the company originally proposed, 4,000K like most towns get. We chose this and then we dimmed further. So all of this curve actually got squashed a bit more. By doing it that way and choosing that particular light, we actually ended up with less blue light than we originally had with the old high pressure sodium. This has never been done before. So that's really exciting. Not only did we prevent a disaster, but we actually went back in time and reduced the amount of harmful blue light. And this is the end result. And we achieved all the things that we sort of were hoping for. The original proposal from the company said we were gonna save, this is sort of the one takeaway here, 71% of electricity with LED. By doing it our way and dimming, so dimming 50% at the first two hours and last two hours, and in the middle, we got down to 30% now. So now we're getting really low in illumination. We're saving 81% electricity. So not only is it a more nighttime friendly environment for all of our creatures, our farming, our human health, safety, but we actually saved a lot more money and a lot more energy. Oh, but wait, we can't save the money part because even though we're using 10 watts and we went from 60 watts to 10, we're still paying 25. So that's still to do. Uh, hopefully that bill passes. Uh, but here's the solution for busy roads that we came up with. So on the other side of the garden, so the garden's over here, chicken coops over here, uh, we put up these screens along our fence that are a little bit higher. So they block some of the extra light, uh, especially disturbing the chickens because everybody knows chickens Sometimes you leave a little extra light on to boost their production. Well, we try to leave them as natural as we can. 
Uh, we try to block any any light coming from the street. Here's that street light right across. We we kind of tuned up our our, our uh, birch trees, let them grow out, prune them a bit, so they sort of filled in those gaps. And you can see that there's light in my neighbor's yard. There's nothing here. It's pretty dark, and you can't detect anything um, from those street lights. And this is what I ended up with. Uh, so this is in my basketball court. Uh, we can just barely see the Milky Way. Um, this is with the high pressure sodium. You can see the orange glow. This is right before they changed the lights. And this is the core. So this should be really bright and beautiful. Uh, you can just barely see it. And this is what I get now. This is the really dim end. This is the north end. Uh, now I'm getting a magnitude of 20.6. So as far as we can tell, at least in my yard, it did get darker again. So we actually managed to restore some of the darkness by doing this just from the streetlights. And this, this is pretty remarkable that I'm actually seeing some you know, actual hydrogen nebulosity. This is where it's really faint. This is the human eye can barely see this, but with just a regular camera, I was able to pick this out. Um, and this is where sort of we, we end up with the starry skies, healthy garden. Notice how the street is right there. It's illuminating my neighbor's trees, maybe the, just the front side of the, the trees. But my garden, these, these plants right here, are getting no light from the street. And you can even still, still see the stars, despite a street light right above them. Uh, so that's, that's about the end of my talk. Um, this was, I took this in, in Vermont um, at Stella at Springfield uh, just a couple weeks ago at Stella Fane. This is just with my camera phone, and this is remarkably dark. Uh, despite there's a prison right over here, uh, they put in some really great lighting of the prison um, and preserved the night sky for the astronomers there. And uh, that's what the Milky Way looks like in Vermont. So um, anyway, that's that's my talk. And I'm going to just let some pretty pictures go by as uh, if you have any questions. That's the moon, Tim. The moon. That's the moon. Great. Um, for anybody, and I didn't mention this earlier, but um, we're hybridizing this session, so people on the computer can hear you. Um, so if you do ask a question, please try to project your voice. Um, this microphone should be able to pick everything up, but it kind of creates that nice community feel. Um, and yeah, just so you know. And um, for those of you who are online, please feel free to raise your hand or type your question in the chat and I can um, relay it on to Tim. Yeah. I just have a comment. I, I live in Bloomington, okay. right next door to Westford, and I personally experienced that decline in the stars, and I, I didn't know exactly why, but you just explained it for me, so thank you for doing that. Um, it's all those strip malls and stuff that weren't there when we moved in, because I've been there for 20 years, and you can just see a glow over around Neshoba now, yeah. um, and it's it's 24-7. Uh, so there's no street lights or anything where we are, but it, it's all that the commercialism that has come up, um, so it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, one of the things, so we, we sort of missed the boat with the, uh, the Market Basket Plaza in Westford near 485, uh, and then the Littleton, the Point Plaza where the movie theater is, we did talk to the developers at the time, and actually uh, went to them, and I, hand, I gave them a copy of this book here, I said, you know, can you please try to at least do better? They did do better, they did put shielded lighting, the problem is there's just so much of it, it's too bright, and, and it's fairly blue. So um, the next step with a lot of these communities is either writing new bylaws or trying to talk to some of the owners of these properties and say, you know, can, is there, can you dim it? Can you cut it down by half because, you know, they're just too bright? Or can you shut off every other light? Like maybe you don't need all the parking lot lights. You know, maybe there isn't as much liability as you think there is. Um, so there's probably some really easy solutions that, you know, they don't need to rip everything out, but maybe we just tweak things and, and everybody would be at least a little bit happier. Great. So we can still do development. Just let's think about it a little bit more when we do it. You go around and talk to um, select boards to educate them on this sort of thing. We do. Um, you know, it, passing bylaws has been really hard. Um, it gets very political, especially in this environment in the last few years. Um, <laughs> um, so it gets quite contentious because I think some people sort of interpret it as you're infringing on you know their sort of freedom of speech in some way or so their safety. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions about safety. A lot of people think that if they leave more lights on. Uh, there was actually just a study done, I think it was in Britain, where um, they found that more lighting uh, actually induced more car break-ins because the criminals could see what they're doing better. Uh, they, there's a famous study too, the Chicago alleyway study. They did the same thing. They illuminated several alleyways thinking that it would drive away criminals. 
it actually made it easier to do crime. So whether it was, you know, you can imagine what kinds of crime, but um, it made it easier to, to perform those tasks uh, when it's, I mean, you can see what you're doing. So um, and anybody who works at night sort of knows that, that like, you know, that's why I have a headlamp, you know, I mean, so I can see what I'm doing. And it makes you more obvious um, if, if it's all dark and then you show up with a headlamp or a flashlight, well, an officer is definitely going to see you prowling around. But if you're just walking around and it's practically daylight out, it's not going to seem that odd, right? So. I can see the officers coming. When I'm in my garden and it's dark and they patrol around the garden with it, head, bright headlights, I can see them coming. So I, I'm sure. <laughs> so I, I can hide so they don't kick me out of my garden. Oh, like, <laughs> is there a curfew? <laughs> Sort of. Okay. Not really. It's not really enforced. Yeah. Um, and not to, again, not to say that you can't have lights in a garden, but just maybe try not doing the solar ones that are just automatically going to be on 365 days a year. You know, find yeah. ones that you can shut off. Or maybe you say like, I like to go in the garden, sit and watch the stars. Fine, but like maybe you shut them off at 11 o'clock or something like I that. Think, I like being out in the garden in the dark. I mean, if it's if I'm out there and my eyes adjust to the sunset and the, the dusk, I know I can see. I don't need lights. I don't need a headlamp or a flashlight or anything. Yeah, the human eye is remarkably adaptable, and I think a lot of people um, discount how well they can actually see at night. Um, you you can certainly you know find your way around even with a little bit of moonlight, even if it's not full or. You know, a little bit of starlight. In fact, um, several creatures actually use the stars to navigate. So certain birds, I know dung beetles actually use the Milky Way to, to figure out north to south. Um, seals use the, use the starlight uh, to navigate. Um, and I know turtles also, uh, especially the ones that go to Florida, use the full moon to sort of interpret which way the, the beach is, which is why they had to cut those lights, was because they were interpreting the moon being north instead of south because it looked a lot brighter on shore than it did from the moon. So that's that's why they, they fixed that problem. A lot of migrating birds at night too. Absolutely, yeah. I have a, a family owned ski area in my town, like three miles away. I can read a newspaper in you know, night skiing and it's just, it's ego. You know, they're proud of their mountain and that light. Yeah, that's one of the things we've we've talked about in our group is, you know, beyond some of these state regulations is talking to specific stakeholders like, you know, whether it's Wachusett or, or some of these other smaller ones that do night skiing. Not to say you can't have night skiing, but maybe we help them redirect their lights a little bit, keep them a little bit down, control the light a little bit, you know. Um, same thing with college campuses, um, you know, whether it's Smith or UMass or have gotten quite hideous at night, uh, the amount of light that you can see from space. So. Uh, certainly some some improvement that, that can be made and you know if we're going to be talking about at my campus MIT is no different you know we talk about greening our campuses but you know lighting is often overlooked in all the check boxes that we that we come up with maybe I missed it when I was in IT world but um, did we did you mention the whether or not plants respond in like a photosynthetic photosynthetic sense like at you know greenhouses with the blue light and everything, but the plants actually respond. We talked a little bit about it with trees, but I'm really interested in that. Yeah, so plants, and, and granted, you know, this is a little bit out of my research area, but yeah, from, from what I've read that uh, there are plants, um, you know, like for example, the soybean, which is a pretty critical right. crop, right. Uh, are very sensitive. So the reason actually that professor posted that was actually really interesting. So the, the eclipse happened in 2017, and there was a question that said, uh, well, won't these plants get disrupted because the sun, you know sun's going to go away? And in fact, what they what he was explaining as part of that that discussion was that uh, no, in fact, daytime light if it goes away, they're not that sensitive. They're sensitive to the nighttime being disrupted. So a few minutes, maybe an hour of bright light will actually cause that disruption. It's not even the full night worth. It's a little bit off, well above the moonlight. It's enough to stimulate them to go into flowering mode. Which is partially what they're doing in these greenhouses, right? They're overstimulating the plant with certain spectrums they've figured out that will stimulate to do what they want. Um, and and so there's lots of plants that are that are like that. Um, you can imagine. There's just it's it's easy to pick on. You know, soybeans are a huge cash crop for the country. And it's important. It's critical to food and a variety of things. But you can imagine there's lots of lots of plants that are going to be affected by 
you know, there's certain ones that drop their, their flowers in the middle of the night, right? Or, or are dropping during the day, but if the nighttime looks like the day, they might miss that pollinator visit that's supposed to pollinate them during the day that's only attracted to them because they're awake during the day. So you get all these things that are mismatching their cycles. So enlightening. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> no, from an ecological perspective, I mean, it is another one of those things. It just makes sense. Like, it just makes sense yeah. how much disruption it causes on the natural cycles that all these insects and plants and fish and birds and humans have evolved with for millions of years. And now, again, within the last 50 years, changed it completely. And how we haven't seen the results of that, how can that affect future evolution and how is it going to change? There's, yeah, there's such, such a ripple effect associated and no, it's really, really good to know. It's, it's something that, to yeah. keep in mind, you know, and, and I, I, again, you know, we call things like, you know, the legislation is called the Dark Sky Bill, sort of an unfortunate name sometimes, and people think we're trying to turn it back to 500 years ago. No, we're just trying to say, let's manage our environment a little bit better. It's called um, the Darker Sky Bill. Yeah. And low-hanging fruit, like you said, it's not that difficult to just put a shield around it to make be more intentional. About the design of these lighting systems. And I'm curious from a municipal perspective, I'm on the board of the Green Worcester Advisory Committee, and how can I help you know drive some of these initiatives as well as in the landscaping world, right? Of course, these higher end clients love their they want brand new landscape, they want to illuminate it. And so from an educational perspective, not only for the client, but also the installers. And you know, I wonder from a product perspective and a lighting design perspective, you know, having education you know, from a trade group perspective or yeah that's another thing we've talked about is actually accessing for example the um you know the brotherhood of uh, electrical workers and so on like the people who actually do the installs because often they're just sort of said told put in a light right you subcontract them to put in a light and they put in the light but they might not know to you can just point it downwards at least so at least it's not pointing up or pointing in a neighbor's yard or you know really easy fixes so maybe you could still have that light and you could thread the needle um, or you know the other option is just if you're bugged out by a light you know I've done I did this a few weeks ago um, new neighbor moved in had a hideous light it was disrupting my astrophotography and I talked to him and explained the issue you know send him some information the lights off now he, he said he was going to redo it and he said you know what? I'll just keep it off I actually don't need it I realized so easy a conversation solved that one will you come talk to my neighbor because i know he won't listen to me, <laughs> he listen to anything to annoy that, me. that's what building inspectors are for <laughs> um setting the bow for presentation <laughs> just thinking about indoor light human beings affected by nighttime indoor yeah. light like that have a whole lot of negative impacts. I have an LED light like right over my bed and I never can't sleep. So yeah, so <laughs> what I would say is like, don't assume because I picked on LEDs a lot that you should remove LEDs and go back to incandescence. I'm definitely not saying that. Um, what I'm saying is just be conscious of what you're doing. Like, you know, if you are using, say like in the kitchen, you might want a brighter light. You might want three or 4,000 K uh, to stay awake, to see what you're doing a little bit better, have a whiter light say you're cutting up vegetables or something like that but maybe the reading light next to your bed maybe you want a warmer colored light so that you know you can read but then not disrupt yourself quite as much definitely don't look at devices now we all do it an hour within an hour of sleep that's sort of what many of the researchers say I mean, guilty as charged but you know uh you can at least with many of the phones now you know you you can dim them and you can actually set it so that um they have it they call it different things but it'll it'll make the, the backlight color more warm um, so it'll disrupt your circadian rhythm, hopefully a little bit less, but, um, yeah, warmer light and, and turn it yeah. off a little earlier. <laughs> yeah. Now I use heavy curtains cause I have to, you know, sometimes sleep through the morning if I'm up late at night for astronomy. So that helps too. Um, a little piece of electrical tape over any of those little led indicators on, you know, they all have these phantom electronics, right? Your TV, mm -hmm. Right, and all the chargers and stuff, they've got these super bright LEDs. Your house, your room might look like a Christmas tree in the middle of the night. Just a little bit of electrical tape, you know, just go after them and <laughs> cover them all up. And then, you know, they can do what they need to do and you oh, know, have uh, these little, little point source LEDs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah all these, like, you know, standby lights and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm personally incredibly sensitive to those little lights. So I, I, I try to hunt them down. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a smoke detector that has a little red thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah.
you know, I would talk to your town and, you know, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And if you live in Massachusetts, please contact your, your state rep or senator because, you know, it's possible we could st still squeak by before the session ends. It's going to be tough, but, um, you know, the bill's there. It's been vetted. It's been studied. And, you know, most, most politicians call it a no-brainer. It's just, you know, we have a tough time passing environmental law in Massachusetts. So. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it.